six feet, 45 feet. That's Wonderful. exactly right. Wonderful. So, and then we lower it slowly because if you jerk it, you jerk it and it triggers, and we have to do it all over again. Right, as you get it to the bottom, you slow it way down. We got it. Okay, I'm gonna let you come to the surface, Steve. This isn't the deadliest catch, but we get just excited about getting good mud. Look at that, that's perfect mud. Yep. Can we do one more? No, we have more than six. What do you mean? We got seven, right? Seven. Yeah, we got one more. That's it. Okay? Okay. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm filling the bucket, obviously, to, so I can have a, um, get this in suspension. That's the most important thing, to get it in the suspension so I can process the sample. And so I have all this sediment now, I'm moving around, and it's forming sort of a chocolate milk, as opposed to being settled onto the bottom. And it turns out that the, the critters that I'm going to pick out are going to be uh, in suspension now. So the chances of me getting them on the first dump is very good. Now we get to the point where the, the screen gets clogged a little bit and you have to unclog it early, but there's relatively little sea life except these little polychaetes, you see? Those are nephthys, and that's part of the community. And the cephala carriage will be here someplace. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to get these animals out of the screen as soon as possible. And this is what we're going to bring back to the lab. This is what they're going to sort. Okay. So I have four to do. I got to buy. I got a nice five valve here to show you. We try to separate the light from the heavy. Here's the nephthys again, right here, nephthys. And then this is the bivalve that I was telling you about. This is a, a living one. This one's dead. That's a living one. And then there's some snails, different types of snails. But this is called Talina, Talina agilis, and this is the only living bivalve that we have out here now. So this sample now is all set to go to Sea uh, Lab uh, in New Bedford, public schools, and we're going to have our friends from Germany help sort this. Okay, well, the last time we met was about four days ago. We were at sea collecting samples with a grab sampler. And here we are now processing those samples, which turned out to be quite a few, by the way, and probably 30 or 40 samples that we collected. And we're washing the mud out and picking and sorting under the microscope. And you're going to have a chance now to talk to the premier people from Germany who are actually working on these animals and working on some very exciting morphological studies, particularly of the nervous system. We have Martin Stigna, Eunice Kyler, and Aaron Feeney, and myself, George Hampson. So we've been sorting here for at least four days. We found a lot of cephalocarids. So you're going to be here from Martin. He's going to talk to you about this and explain what he does. Thank you. So this is the column. This is a core, a core sample. It means this is the sediment just as it is in the sea. And what we want to do now, we want to remove the sediment from this tube. The animals we're looking for are cephalocarids. They are small crustaceans. And they are supposed to live in a so-called flocculent zone. This is the zone uh, between, well, it's on the very top of the sediment. And what I'll do now, I want to remove the water on top of the sediment. And we will keep the water because some cephalocarids uh, tend to swim in the water. Gently push up 
the sediment within the column now. I need your hand from the other side. Now there's the sediment. The water is taken off now and what is still in the tube is the sediment and the sediment consists of different layer. The upper layer is well oxygen richer than the lower layer of course. The lower layer tends to be anoxic and the cephalocarots are supposed to live in, on the very top in this flocculent zone where the layer is still very loose. This is our first sediment sample, sample probably the best one. This will be the second one. Here we go. We've done that before and we found two cephalocarots in, on the very top of this sample and one cephalocarot uh, in the lower sample. So last time we just split it up into two layers. That means their density is not especially high. It's very difficult finding them uh, almost black now. And this is the beginning of the anoxic layer. We don't expect uh, many cephalocarots in this layer. That's how we got rid of the sediment sample and put it into these boxes. And this screen has very, very small holes in it and the cephalocarots just do not fit through these holes. We just have to put a few parts of the sediment and all animals in the water to the very bottom of this bottom of the screen. So I'd say 90% of the animals and of the plant matter that was still in the water sample is in this uh, in these two petri dishes now. And we will hand them over to George. Now, Mike, what I'm seeing in here is all kinds of sand grains and fecal pellets. Oh, ho, 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 ho. oh my God. This is a copepod. It looks just like a cephalocarot. I touched him and he popped away. He's got a red eye. Very good. Yeah, we came the long way from Germany, from the University of Rostock to look for cephalocarots here and the interesting thing about cephalocarots they are one of only five big groups of crustaceans and they are actually living fossils. Uh, they, a lot of uh, parts of their external morphology uh, look like uh, the morphology of crustaceans several hundreds of million years ago. There are 11 species of cephalocarots all over the world but the only place uh, to find them at a reliable scale is New Bedford and this is actually the place where the first cephalocarot was found by Howard Sanders in 1955. We have a professional helper here, George Hampson, also a biologist and he has been working together with Bob Hesler for many years um, <coughs> and Bob Hesler was actually a student of Howard Sanders. It's very difficult finding them. You've seen many steps of this process. This is the uh, <coughs> actually the final step of searching for them under the microscope. We have this green sediment here and it takes a whole week uh, with many helpers uh, to find about 30 individuals. And what we're doing in Germany with, uh, with these animals, we are studying the nervous system. I told you that the external morphology uh, shows a lot of ancient traits and what we want to find out uh, if the nervous system is also very ancient because uh, it's a hypothesis that if the external morphology is ancient the nervous system could also be ancient. What we found out so far is uh, that the nervous system is very very complex, uh, more complex than any other uh, nervous system within crustacea. So, and it's very difficult to interpret these findings other crustacea have to be studied again but this animal uh, bears a lot of riddles and we try to solve them. I want to quickly explain you uh, the method which one method that we are using in Germany to visualize the nervous system. This is a classical semi-thin section it is one micrometer thick very very slim and these sections have been done for several hundred years but with our uh, modern techniques, we can uh, digitize the sections, we can digitize a whole series of sections, 900 digital photos of 900 sections, 
and we put them all into one line. First we invert the colors to uh, reduce the size of the JPEG. Put them in one line so that the sections uh, get the same position as in the original animal. And then our computer program uh, turns 2D pixels into a 3D uh, image stack of 900 different JPEGs. And this uh, image stack uh, gives us the possibility to visualize the original animal in all three dimensions. Here you see three different projections of the animal, Hutchinson yella macrocanta. This is the species we found in New Bedford and you can also have 3D pictures of the surface of the animal here you just see the outer surface of the animal, the cuticle and the very nice thing is now you can take these projections and you can surround single structures such as the nervous system on these sections you can draw lines manually using your computer you can construct a grid of differently marked uh, uh, sections within the virtual image stack and you can calculate 3D models. On this picture for example you see a side projection of the whole uh, anterior part that's the front part of the animal. The green thing is the gut. You see the gut in Hutchinson yella is in the very top of the animal and the nervous system is this uh, yellowish and gray stuff. And you really see that you can reconstruct the different segments uh, from uh, different sides of the body so you can uh, have different projections of the same structure it gives us a completely new possibility of visualizing the brain so this was the, the general thing I think and what I want to uh, come back to is this complexity of the nervous system now I will uh, just show you another slide of a structure called the multi-lobed complex uh, this is a reconstruction of the brain. Look at the left side of this slide. You see the structure of many different little lobes. These yellow structures are condensations of nervous tissue that occur in the brain of Hutchinson yella macrocanta. And I have to say uh, that this structure, this multi-lobed complex, is connected to the olfactory system. You see these two big balls down here? These are the olfactory lobes. They are big structures that are there and they, they exist for the procession of smelling input. That means that Hutchinson yella macrocanta <coughs> has a very good nose. And no other arthropod has this structure in the brain. This multilobed complex is totally unique. And this is something that fascinates us. And uh, we will have to do further work to interpret these findings. Because uh, if you look at a lobster's brain or at a crayfish brain, it looks completely different and my impression is that it even looks more simple. So uh, that's what I said in the beginning, Hutchinson yella macrocanta gives us a lot of riddles and it will take some work to solve these riddles. Thank you. One thing that we probably should say something about is our friends from Rostock, Germany, their findings, Martin Steinger particularly, has found out that this brain, this nervous system of the cephalocarid is so advanced, and yet it's a primitive crustacean, 300 to 500 million years old is when the fossil has been found that looks very similar to this. And yet, as Martin says, it has one of the most advanced nervous systems of any of the crustacean that we know so far. So that's the dilemma. And that's the wonderful thing about science. You think you know it all, and you do your research, and all of a sudden something happens like this. So right now, it's primitive, but it has an advanced nervous system, and that is a big dilemma for us. Thank you.